Hello, everyone, and welcome to our lecture on David Foster Wallace's Consider the Lobster. Uh, this is a segment for RIT 1003, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity to share my thoughts on this piece. Thank you uh, to our professor, Dr. McCashew, for allowing me to contribute to this. Um, as part of my personal professional development um, in my uh, doctorate studies, um, but also as a grateful student of uh, York University's writing department um, for a number of years and um, as a dedicated uh, thinker and writer in the style that I think Wallace performs, we, which we can call um, a kind of hypersensitivity to others' expectations on what one um, is presumed to um, be requested to do in a particular genre. So that's the theme. Uh, here are our lecture slides, which you can also um, uh, review without my narration. I'd like to begin by introducing um, the piece with this photograph, which I took at a local grocery store of a um, lobster, which probably belongs to the Homaris americanus uh, uh, genus, the type that lives in North America. We are actually geographically very close to Maine, um, the location where the uh, major lobster festival takes place, or at least used to take place um, annually in July. So uh, prior to reading this text, I knew nothing about Maine and its lobster festival, I should say. And also I was completely innocent of David Foster Wallace's writing. Um, he is a novelist or was a novelist and um, uh, his uh, most famous work called Infinite Jest is something that I haven't read yet, I have to admit. Um, but certainly this piece uh, written for the Gourmet magazine uh, really drew me in. And so it was um, something uh, that in the course syllabus attracted me as a piece I'd like to uh, reflect upon. Also, for this week, we are thinking about voice and the construction of voice as a kind of um, establishment of the relationship to the audience through uh, syntax, rhetorical devices. Um, how do you construct the piece to speak um, in the many different senses of that word to the, the readers? Um, so I'd like to begin by kind of casting our glance back at what we have read in this course. And just as a side note, if you're so inclined, you can have David Foster Wallace's um, recording of himself reading, of him reading his uh, uh, piece here uh, is the link on YouTube of a, perform a voice performance of Consider the Lobster. So, I'd like us to recall the uh, very early reading in our course, Brian Doyle's Joyous Valadores, which began with the sentence, consider the hummingbird for a long moment. So this call to consider a creature, an animal, um, is something that um, I think seems to be a 20th century, um, if not cliche, then a, um, a philosophically underpinned uh, gesture that as humans, we um, tended to dismiss animals um, and not give them perhaps enough credit, arguably, uh, in their capacities to uh, feel, emote, and think, and etc. So one of the questions that the uh, text obviously raises is what it means to actually give consideration to an animal as a human uh, animal. And I'd like to recommend, I suppose, if you wanna really deeply ponder this uh, topic on a philosophical level um, beyond what I'll be doing in this lecture, it's a book by Jacques Derrida and it's called The Animal That Therefore I Am. 
um, a quote from this book will give you a taste of what um, Derrida suggests in his treatment of what it means to relate um, or uh, to relate to an animal or consider an animal. He writes, even the word animal, a pseudo violent concept presupposes a homogeneity, um, which Derrida actually doubts. So he coins another word, animal, uh, meaning word in French, animal is just a word we coined. How can you uh, group, bunch all animals together under one word is one of the philosophical questions that he asks in the book. Anyway, philosophy aside, recall Michael Pollan's much more, I would say, ironic, um, at times uh, sarcastic, at times merely humorous uh, piece, An Animal's Place, which uh, begins with an allusion to Peter Singer's Animal Liberation, a very serious treatment of animal rights, and also uh, an uh, abolitionist um, novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, again, uh, you know, the contrast between um, uh, sort of advocating animal rights as opposed to uh, lobbying for uh, equal treatment of all humans, you know, there's a lot there, but I would like you to think about what echoes among these um, texts, uh, meaning Doyle's, Poland's, Wallace's, and I'll bring one more into discussion uh, shortly, what echoes do you um, notice among these texts? And if they all have something in common, think about the one you may have liked more than the rest and consider what the author's voice uh, or treatment of the subject um, uh, appealed to you the most. So, um, just a little side note again, um, when we think about voice, uh, we can think about uh, tonality uh, in the sense of actual uh, sonic production, you know, the, the ability to uh, speak at a high pitch or a low uh, tone, etc. But when we're talking about rhetoric, we're thinking about uh, the emotional connotations um, attached to the voice of the author. So somebody on YouTube uh, um, video of Foster Wallace reading his piece actually commented that, quote, his voice embodies the season of winter. And um, so is it as, is the piece itself, the text, as melancholic or, um, you know, winter in traditional sort of uh, readings of literature, uh, is this scene a, a season associated with death, uh, something melancholic, etc. So, uh, is it all doom and gloom? I would argue no, um, but let's take a look at some of the twists and turns in Consider the Lobster and how essentially uh, Wallace is playing with the multiple genres in food writing and uh, challenges uh, some of the expectations um, therein. So one more recall, please, moment. Um, remember Young Hunger by Emma, um, MKF Fisher. Um, she is the author also of The Gastronomical Me, which I highly, highly recommend um, as a delightful um, uh, collection of uh, autobiographical reflections upon growing up in America and then moving to France to become a gourmand. Um, uh, or something like that. So anyway, so the Fisher piece, if you recall, Young Hunger, um, for me, it, it delights me with playfulness and a kind of uh, irony that is lighthearted. Um, but the focus of, I would say, Fisher's writing um, is what kind of an emotional connection, an emotional affair that eating is or is meant to be if you are a gourmand. And so I would argue lightly that anyone who writes about food seriously is concerned with the emotional and cultural uh, sort of questions of modern subjectivity considerations of eating. Uh, in other words, cooking is an art, 
as an eater, you're a part of this world and the ecosystem and all the questions and concerns that um, uh, arrive with those considerations. So what then Foster Wallace stages um, is uh, what Professor Mikashu has called in our conversation, thinking against yourself, especially in all his uh, footnotes where there's a kind of flip-flopping between um, the kind of writing perhaps that is expected, more expected uh, of uh, someone presenting uh, the festival as a big spectacle um, and a, you know, a cultural affair of, you know, consuming lobsters in a joyful kind of carnival way. Um, and the, some of the footnotes really are uh, designed to give you um, a critique of uh, what such festivals uh, underbelly, you know, the dark side um, is. Um, and some of them are sheer um, datum, as he calls it, you know, gives you facts of how many ridiculous amount, tons of lobster um, is consumed annually in the US. So just one footnote on footnotes. I really was surprised by footnote number seven um, and Wallace's confession about his innocence or lack of knowledge about quote, standard meat industry operations, specifically where he, uh, the reason he comments on this is because he talks about the lobsters being kept alive in tanks and having their uh, um, claws bound, I almost said hands, bound with rubber uh, bands in order for uh, to keep to pacify them and not to hurt each other and the de-beaking kind of practices or dehorning and so on like the removal of horns um, uh, on cattle uh, in order to prevent the animals uh, to uh, from mutilating each other um, that if you read the piece just from beginning to end and not look at the footnotes I think at least this is how I see it you would suspect that Wallace is a lot more, uh, or was for a while, more initiated into animal rights kind of um, uh, uh, texts, discourses, etc. cetera. Um, so the confession that he didn't really know anything about mass production, factory farming and all that before he started working on this piece is a little surprising to me. And I don't know what you make of that. Okay. So let's start some of our close reading. I'll say that I think that there's part one of the piece before we get flipped or a kind of, it's a kind of a switch of registers um, that Wallace performs. So part one, what we may call narratio, like the establishment of uh, facts, the setting of what the object of his description is. Uh, here's the paragraph, uh, number one, where you get uh, an explanation of when the main lobster festival takes place in late July, where it is geographically. And interestingly, the uh, western side uh, of Maine is described as the nerve stem of the lobsters industry. And uh, for me, it um, alludes to, it signals that kind of discussion of the um, lobster's nervous system. And the one salient point for me, for example, with the stem, uh, the word stem, uh, in the technical part, the piece that's most sort of technical writing about cooking a lobster, uh, Foster Wallace says that, you know, an easy way to check if your lobster is ready for eating is to try to pluck its, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, whisker or whatever, uh, stem thing off its uh, head. And if it comes out easily, then you know, you're know you ready to eat. So there are clues already in the first paragraph um, what um, the piece will be attempting to do. I also find the uh, kind of meta commentary here 
in brackets about the summer traffic being unimaginable. Um, you know, as an editor, I would ask actually if this is a necessary sentence here in an opening paragraph, which, you know, is an important um, introduction to your whole piece. But I think it sets up the way the mechanics of, of, of the piece, the way it'll continue to say something and then unsay it or say it differently or or contradict it. Um, you know, the, the most, I think, salient for me also um, uh, moment that establishes the kind of what Wallace at the end calls confusion, but I think it's more of a, a tortured relationship to the topic um, is the fact that lobsters are essentially sea insects, but they are good eating, right? So that kind of flip-flopping um, happens throughout the piece. And then of course, um, uh, the first footnote, um, the, uh, as he writes, comprehensive native apothem, Camden by the sea, Rockland by the smell, um, the more industrial, uh, you know, blue color worker kind of Rockland contrast to Camden, the gentrified uh, place. Um, again, there are politics of uh, economy that are uh, not extensively, but to some extent explored in the piece. In particular, I found it really shocking to find out that um, uh, lobster was considered to be akin to rat meat um, in the 19th century and the, the notion that prisoners ate lobster um, uh, is an interesting side commentary. If you are inclined to be amused and entertained um, by, uh, <laughs> I mean, this has nothing to do with the text, but I thought I would share this. Uh, Fred Armisen has a sketch on different um, accents found across the United States. And he begins with Maine and he says, Maine, you almost hear England in there. Um, so again, nothing to do, but I think that um, it gives you a nice overview of US geography, which again, maybe not something that um, in Canada we're particularly um, good with. I certainly uh, couldn't label most of the states, I think, other than some of the most famous ones. Totally tangential, but I think the reason I am amused slash um, uh, sort of uh, uh, grab by this kind of comedic uh, performance is because um, it plays again with what our imagination of a country um, is and um, the, the, the voice is treated interestingly. Um, the idea of how um, different places even in one country may have uh, a certain character, a certain uh, performance of their uh, identity, right? So I don't know if you'll find it useful, but I certainly find it entertaining at the very least. So tangents uh, gone, I will focus now on the text more. Um, I'd like to ask um, if in the first few paragraphs, you can already detect or suspect uh, the kind of animal rights uh, tendency um, that will emerge uh, more throughout the piece. And also just think about, you know, the uh, publication uh, audience's expectations. So according to New York Times, Gourmet was uh, to food what Vogue is to fashion. And if you'd like to read that article about uh, the Gourmet, you may uh, follow this link. So what do people expect uh, when they read the Gourmet um, uh, magazine? I mean, first of all, it is no longer, um, uh, it no longer exists as Gourmet, um, but uh, before, uh, its uh, shift into something else uh, in the uh, early 21st century. Um, the kind of, I think, expectation that I presume, because I'm not a reader of the Gourmet, um, I presume that 
readers would um, expect to learn something uh, culturally relevant about uh, the particular food, food practice, recipe, etc. Um, perhaps gardening and, and so on. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the kind of expectation probably is captured here in this paragraph where Wallace writes, lobster is essentially a summer food. Very simple um, topic sentence. This is because we now prefer lobsters fresh, which means they have to be recently caught, which for both tactical and economic reasons takes place at depths of less than 25 fathoms. Lobsters tend to be hungriest and most active, i.e. most trappable at summer water temperatures of 45 to 50 Fahrenheit. In the autumn, some main lobsters migrate out into deeper water either for warmth or to avoid the heavy waves that pound New England's coast all winter. Some burrow into the bottom. They might hibernate. Nobody's sure. So, you know, very kind of simple, almost kind of mechanic, uh, technical description of uh, lobsters habits and you know, if you're at a nice um, party um, somewhere in a fancy um, uh, community, you know, sipping wine and talking about um, the, the joy of eating lobster, you could show off some of these um, little tidbits of uh, facts about um, lobster life or, you know, when it's best to trap lobsters, etc. So I think that that kind of captures um, or this is one small sample of what I think would be expected of Foster Wallace when he was asked to write the um, piece on the main festival. So um, I should also add that the opening paragraph sounds like uh, what readers would expect, the history of the festival, its magnitude, the fun facts, etc. But um, I also uh, imagine that uh, the, as he calls it, sort of cultural imaginary uh, baggage around lobsters as a type of posh food is, again, what um, was expected. And he even uh, addresses the idea that uh, the main lobster festival is a kind of uh, gesture towards democratizing lobster, that you don't have to be rich, rich and fancy uh, in order to enjoy uh, lobster. And so again, another, I think, uh, paragraph that exemplifies what should have been in this kind of uh, publication uh, or this kind of article in the Gourmet um, is this one. As an a la carte entree, lobster can be baked, broiled, steamed, grilled, sauteed, stir fried, or microwaved. Not sure that that should be there um, because that is certainly not a posh way of cooking. The most common method though is boiling. If you're someone who enjoys having lobster at home, this is probably the way you do it since boiling is so easy. You need a large kettle with cover with, and then, you know, he gets into actually like almost giving you a recipe for cooking a lobster. Um, and um, uh, this is part of what I think, you know, is, is more performative in the piece, um, or at least it's a, a gesture of meeting the, at least some part of the quota of expectations. Um, and of course, you know, you can think about the danger of playing too much into the imagined audience's expectations. The thrust of the piece is nothing like this, uh, really. I mean, it's good for context, but um, I imagine the piece would work if some of these parts were removed. It wouldn't um, necessarily damage the overall um, effect. And yet it's there. And so it's worth asking what this kind of really uh, technical, I guess, for the lack of a better word, writing is doing here. Um, you know, if this was the only paragraph as a sample of the piece that you read, you would have never guessed uh, what else uh, Wallace was um, interested in 
uh, saying when talking about the main lobster festival, right? So um, I would say, not that I'm in any way a math, uh, kind of mathematically inclined person, but, you know, there's, as I suggested, there's this kind of ups and downs, pluses and minuses, or consider, you know, the, some of the upsides, I guess, of um, what people like about the main festival, you know, uh, there's this whole narrative of, you know, in the taxi cab, actually asking locals about their opinion um, uh, on uh, what the main lobster festival is and whether they approve of it or not. And it seems like there's this um, construction of mythical approval, which um, uh, Wallace kind of troubles with the comments that, yeah, everybody likes the main festival who lives uh, there, but um, they seem to never go. They haven't been in years, etc. Anyway, so in the opening of the piece, you have the words, uh, these are some of the uh, adjectives to describe the festival. Enormous, probably a good thing. If you're someone who wants to organize a festival, you would probably want it to be large, pungent, maybe not a word with positive connotation in any way. Um, imaginable, well-marketed, probably a good thing, joyful, definitely great, lucrative, fantastic, loud. Um, on the subject of loud, there's a particular passage where Wallace, um, I think, almost makes one cringe, um, at least I cringed, when reading this sentence. Uh, this is in the main tent of the main lobster festival. It is loud and a good percentage of total noise is masticatory. Mm. So sitting cheek to jowl, I think he says, uh, you know, with kids who are of various uh, motor capacity skills, not enough napkins, people bringing or sneaking in their own beer, etc. I mean, that paragraph, um, if that's not ridicule, I don't know what would be. That is certainly no advertisement um, to the festival. Um, and perhaps an even more cringeworthy sentence, as I said previously, the point is that lobsters are basically giant sea insects. So having read that uh, with uh, uh, my fairly intense arachnophobia and general distaste for um, insects, I would say that it is hard to um, go back and unread that sentence. I am guilty of having occasional lobster on vacation, and I have to say that I've reconsidered my relationship to this um, critter, prehistoric critter at that. Anyway, so, okay, so giant sea insects, but then we get this uh, sentence shortly thereafter, and I'm not sure if it's redemptive enough, having called them sea insects, Wallace kind of steps back um, for whose uh, purpose or benefit, I'm not sure, and says, but they are themselves good eating. So um, I'm curious what you think about that um, tension there. And then finally, you know, I, I will start to wrap up because there is much to say about the different um, passages and the PETA um, sections, segments, and commentary on the kind of um, good um, intention, bad execution of the PETA representatives. You know, I mean, I forget exactly what he calls them, but basically fanatics um, would be the word to summarize it. But there, there is a consideration of um, our, again, um, ability to understand other creatures. And I call this part, no brain, no pain. Um, the idea that lobsters, um, you know, I guess those who say that there's nothing wrong uh, ethically, morally with boiling lobsters alive argue that their nervous system is so primitive that they are not able to uh, really experience suffering the way that I guess we imagine suffering 
is morally wrong. So uh, Wallace contests that with the idea that lobsters might suffer more pain than we do due to their lack of, quote, opioid receptors. Um, and this, again, as I'm suggesting, offers a hefty ethical question that Wallace wraps uh, also in speculations of behavioral signs of suffering. And then I also find the third eye, you know, why is that there? The third eye reference uh, where some people choose to stick a knife, um, knife in the head, mercy killing practice by those who believe that maybe actually lobsters do suffer while being cooked alive. So third eye, you know, without going on another tangent, is in the Eastern tradition, you know, a higher sense of self. It's actually arguably, you know, like your sixth sense. And so that phrase there, um, to me at least, signals that, you know, lobsters might be a lot more complex in their ability to experience not only suffering and pain, but in general to experience, to relate, than we may give them credit for. So, um, that passage also ends with, you know, what uh, Wallace says is probably the most cruel or the crueler at least way of cooking your lobster by poking holes in the living animal and then sticking it into a microwave. Um, again, this rhetorically most certainly does not fit into something someone reading the gourmet would expect. Um, so then to return to the reader's expectations, um, it, again, just to contrast that kind of discussion of microwaving and the, you know, third eye and all that, I think that, you know, he again offsets um, a lot of this discussion with passages that at least would please the readers of Gourmet to some extent. So, quote, the meat of a lobster is richer and more substantial than most fish its taste more subtle compared to the marine gaminess of mussels and clams in the US pop food imagination. Lobster is now the seafood analog to steak with which it's so often twinned as surf and turf on the re really expensive part of the chain steak house menu. I don't know if that's only a North American kind of practice. I, um, I apologize, I didn't research this, but surf and turf to me, I suppose, um, from a kind of nutritionist slash health and wellness perspective is just probably one of the worst things you can do to your stomach to mix that kind of, you know, heavy sea food and um, animal meat in one meal. But that again is a tangential point I will not pursue. So, <sighs> One of the things that I think, and this is the image I have of the Derrida book I recommended earlier, The Animal That Therefore I Am, you know, earlier, much earlier in the piece, before all this discussion of what the lobster may suffer uh, or how it may suffer and what PETA says about it and all that, um, you have this sentence where uh, Wallace uh, suggests to us that it's become really commonplace, not just in restaurants, but in even grocery stores to see a tank with lobsters and you can pick it out, you know, while it watches you point. So um, the idea that we are in some form of a relationship to the food that we eat is probably something that is more common uh, in even a publication like Gourmet, uh, Gourmet sorry, um, than not, but it is probably treated differently from what Wallace um, performs in this piece. So again, I'd like to ask you what the juxtaposition of narration and refutation do in this piece to number one, the expectations of an average gourmet reader. Uh, for example, um, it appears, uh, this is Wallace in the concluding paragraphs of his piece, uh, he writes, it appears to me unlikely that many readers of Gourmet wish to think hard about all the ethical questions that he's brought up uh, in uh, considering the lobster. And then two, also to the large 
co larger context of animal philosophy, uh, discourses of or, or rhetoric um, around um, the um, uh, yeah treatment of animals, animal rights, animal um, welfare, uh, the abomination that uh, factory farming is, etc. And um, how this fits into what the um, editor in chief of Gourmet was expecting when uh, the editor commissioned uh, Wallace to write um, a piece on what it was like to attend the 2003 uh, Maine Lobster Festival. Um, I mean, you know, this is actually a, a uh, phrase from Wallace's piece that um, I think gestures towards justifying the way he wrote Consider the Lobster, you know, that he wasn't asked to write uh, a piece that glorifies the MLF, but rather he was asked to write what it was like to attend the MLF in 2003, which is what he performs, I think, um, with some degree of earnestness and uh, um, a desire to be thoughtful. And finally, uh, in the opening, again, to return to the opening paragraph, uh, we get the phrase deliberate collision. Um, and I think that's a phrase that we can apply to uh, the kind of work um, that uh, this article performs, um, that it's a food centered festival and he compares them to some others um, and that it, it essentially in the end for Wallace the MLF borders on a spectacle worthy of quote a Roman circus or medieval torture fest so he expresses openly his anxiety not to quote come off as shrill or preachy um, but Again, he wraps it in a seemingly, to me at least, coy pronouncement of being confused, that he is so confused and maybe tortured by the treatment of the subject at hand. So again, consider the hummingbird, consider the animal, consider the lobster. How do we relate to our audience's expectations and how do we construct our ability to express our perhaps anxieties or concerns, but also obligations as a writer to their audience, the imagined audience? So I'd like to ask my group in particular, um, what is your imagined relationship to the final work, uh, the final uh, commercial piece that you are authoring in the next couple of weeks? And um, how does it fit into the established genres? So a little bit of research go goes a long way, as I've suggested before. But what then, having established some of the uh, generic expectations, where do you want to take those and why? What is your purpose? What is your relationship to it? What would you like to achieve? And then, consequently, where would it be published? I'd like to thank you very much, Spasiba, for your attention. And I hope that um, we get to talk more about Wallace's piece in my tutorial. Oops. Take care.